All right, hitting the road early. What'd you guys bring for breakfast? Strawberries. Where do you think we're going? Poteet? Ooh, not going to Pecos either, guys. Hey, grapefruit. Yeah, but Rio Grande Valley is next season. Ah, now we're talking. Because we're heading to Orange. <laughs> This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. The land of the oranges is right on the line where Texas ceases to beat Texas. Only 100 miles east of Houston, but far enough away to feel like you've already crossed the border into something completely different. Some call this the Gateway City, but it's not just a gateway to Texas, but to Texas Cajun culture and rich Texas history. In fact, Orange was Texas's first official county back in 1852. Yes, Orange is ripe with history, and if you start squeezing this fruit, the juice starts flowing, flowing like the old Sabine. All right, so this right here is the Sabine River, the place where Texas ends. And just to give you an idea of how far east we are, that right over there is Louisiana, the Pelican State. Oh, I get chills just looking at it. But I think today we should stick here in the Lone Star State. All right, back on the road. Nothing wrong with our good neighbors to the east. Well, that's a whole nother bag of gators. And there's plenty to explore here on the Texas side. Now, it takes a lot of wood to build a city, and Orange was no exception. But this town wasn't just built with wood. This town was built on wood. The lumber industry was huge down here, bringing lots of affluence to both this community and to the Stark family. This is Samantha from the Stark Foundation, and we are standing in front of one of the most beautiful houses in Texas. Yes, it is. This was the home of W.H. and Miriam Stark. It was built in 1894, and it's the Queen Anne architecture style. It's 14,000 square feet. It has three stories and a full basement. So let's head in and check them out. The Stark home is a majestic masterpiece. But before we start the tour, I know what you're thinking. Was this family related to Iron Man Tony Stark? And yes, yes they were. In fact, it was here in the workshop that the first ever prototype was built using primitive materials like wood and tin foil, making W.H. Stark the original wood foil man. Choo choo, lasers and boo pew. Uh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm getting something from our fact checker. No Tony Stark relation? Uh, uh ne never mind what I was saying. Let's just stick to the tour. It turns out by 1800 standards, this family lived even better than billionaire Tony Stark. Well, the family made their uh, money in the lumber industry here in East Texas, and it really shows in their home. All of the paneling, door frames, window framing is all curly, long leaf yellow pine. Okay. You don't actually know if it's going to be curly until you cut the lumber open, but they own the lumber mills. So as they were planning to build their house, when a good piece of curly pine came through, they saved it for themselves. The Starks home is truly a showroom for the forest. And when you own the largest sawmill in Texas, uh, why not? But beyond the woodwork, the home also showcases the Stark's elaborate style and their bite from the travel bug. Well, this is the music room, which is very light and feminine. You can also see some of the Stark's love of travel. On our ceiling is actually one big souvenir. It's an oil painting that has been done on canvas and then set into the ceiling with this beautiful plaster mold. Wow, the most yes. I've ever brought home is like a postcard. Yes, <laughs> yeah, she brought an oil painting. Oh uh, yeah, so. <laughs> a painting for the yes. ceiling. This whole house is full of items, had only by the highest members of society, to which the Starks certainly qualified. Well, the Stark family loved to entertain, and this was their everyday china. <laughs> wow, not just china, this is just the everyday china. Everyday china, As opposed yes. to the fancy china. Yes. <laughs> well, this is the second floor. This was the family's private living area. Now, this house was built before indoor plumbing was available. However, that didn't stop the Starks from having some pretty nice bathrooms. 
this was the original chamber set. It's Limoges porcelain from the Limoges region of France, and it's hand painted with this daffodil pattern to match the theme of the room. So the best available. Oh, best available. Best that, available. That would definitely qualify as the fanciest potty I'd ever Fancy, used. Fancy, yes. They wanted their guests to have the best yeah. of everything. Fancy bathrooms, fancy sitting areas. There was even a live-in nurse with her own private room. And let's be honest, what gal wouldn't want a closet like this one? But don't worry guys, Mr. Stark had himself a pretty sweet man cave. Well, this is our tower room. This room's had a lot of uses throughout the years. They had parties up here and would have a band up in our turret space. Amazing. This room also shows off the family's collection of Napoleon. I was about to yes. say, I see a recognizable yes. face around here As everywhere. you start looking, he is everywhere in sculpture, in painting, on the decorative pieces, and of course, our Napoleon death mask. <laughs> I've seen one of these before, and it's amazing to find two of them here in Texas in beautiful old homes. Yes, yes. They're, it's a very mysterious piece with an interesting history. It is still creepy. It no matter is. how many times I see yes. it. Yes, uh, he, he it looks is. at you as you walk about the room. <laughs> <laughs> the Starks' home is like a museum. In fact, some of the items are so rare that the only other one is in the Smithsonian. It's an incredible taste of high Texas culture, which reminds me, it's time to find some of my own Texas tastes and sticking with Orange's historic traditions. How about lunch at the Old Orange Cafe? The walls of this old building are covered with old photos, hearkening back to the olden days of Orange. Old hanging on old on top of old. However, the food coming out of this kitchen is anything but, as the Old Orange Cafe is putting a fresh spin on both history and home cooking. All right, so this is David Claybar, the owner and chef here at Old Orange Cafe. Man, it smells great in here. Tell me about this building, though. This building was uh, originally a, a pasteurizing dairy. It was built in 1937. It was open for about eight years. In April of 1990, it was opened by Susan and Terry Childers as Old Orange Cafe. How would you describe the food you guys cook in here? We do everything from hamburgers and chicken fried steak to a lot of fresh seafood. We use the freshest ingredients possible. We, we try and do everything we can from scratch with a, with a pretty strong Cajun influence. Right. Does that come from you? Or? It does come from me. I was born and raised right here in Orange. Well, I've got salt in my blood and I love to hunt and fish and, and so i got to be right here close to it. And that love of seafood and the spicy Cajun flavors of Southeast Texas are all over the menu. This place is awesome. It has all kinds of nice pictures on it. You come in here and just live atmosphere and character, right? A lot I of mean, character. character. Yeah. I got the shrimp burger. Shrimp burger? What's that, like fried shrimp on a bun? Yeah, and the bun's really good. Well, how's the, how are the shrimp? It's, it's awesome. It's awesome. It's the best spicy chicken sandwich I ever have in the okay. United States. <laughs> With authority. What'd you order? Uh, country fried steak. Nice. That's a regular. I get that everywhere I go for the first time to see what they all are about. <laughs> that's right. You can judge a place on, on its chicken fried steak, that is, right? That's how I judge a place. That's right. <laughs> so whether the occasion calls for celebration, historical pictorial appreciation, or just lunch, Old Orange Cafe hits the spot. And for lunch today, well, you know how the Cajuns like to keep things spicy. All right, so I got the Old Orange Cafe spicy chicken sandwich. First off, this thing's on a jalapeno cheese sourdough bun, but look what's inside. <laughs> okay, so it's got spicy mayo, seasoned chicken, fried jalapenos, sriracha chili sauce. This thing is gonna be hot on every level. Mm. Oh, that is good. You know, I was expecting it to sort of knock me out of the water, but that is just the perfect amount of spice. There we go, there we go. So there was one of the fried jalapenos and uh, yeah, they're fresh jalapenos. Oh yeah, feel the burn, savor the burn, love the burn. That is so good. I totally forgot. There's also pepper jack cheese on this thing. Every opportunity to bite you. I love a local place like this. It's packed with the community people and really fantastic, fantastic food. Oh yeah. Now this is enough to keep me tripping. So the Stark House may feel like a piece of artwork, but believe it or not, if you want to see the Stark's premier collection, well then all you got to do is cross the street to the Stark Museum of Art. 
Okay, so this is Sarah Bame, the curator here at the Stark Museum. This is truly a world-class collection, so tell me a little bit about it. This collection was started by H.J. Lutcher Stark. This is an incredible collection of American Western art from the early 19th century up through the 20th century, showing the land, the people, and the wildlife, the exciting and dramatic stories of the American West and the founding, really, of our nation. These right here, obviously, I mean, I recognize this artist, Frederick Remington, of course. Exactly. We open up with the sculpture of Frederick Remington, one of the major artists of the American West who created iconic images. It only starts with Remington, and onward from there to some of the biggest names in Western art. It's a collection that could easily stand on its own in the Big Apple, here in the small orange. Coming into our gallery, picturing the Wild West. And this gallery includes w works of art from the turn of the century that show everybody's classic idea of the Wild West, the West of the cowboy and the Indian, often in conflict, often in a very narrative story about what's going on in the American West. You know, this art more than any other captures so much action in a still image or sculpture. I know it's not moving, but if you look at it long enough, you sort of feel like it is. Like each one of the expressions on these guys' faces is telling something, everything that's going on. And you can often invent a story around what's happening. <laughs> I love this artwork. Not just because I love cowboys, but I, you know, I love this artwork too. H.J. Lutcher Stark loved the rough and tumble Wild West, perhaps because it was so different from his childhood across the street in the mansion. But I'm just thankful he didn't keep it locked up in the mansion and instead put it here for all of us to enjoy. This gallery presents the art of early 20th century, particularly focusing on artists who've traveled to live in the West and particularly in New Mexico. Incredible landscape, the beautiful light of New Mexico that provided a wonderful inspiration for them to paint in. And it also had a cultural life that inspired the artists, particularly the, the lives of the Pueblo Indians who were able to maintain their traditions and the Hispanic cultures in the area that also presented another exotic subject for uh, painters uh, of the time. H.J. Lutcher Stark didn't just love artwork about the native people, he also loved the artwork of the native people. We have examples from the plains and the southwest and the northwest coast as well where the people incorporate artistic style into their everyday objects and to the objects of special occasions, such as this extraordinary war shirt. Animal hide, and then decorated with uh, weasel tails, dyed feathers, and most importantly with quill work. American Indians would use porcupine quills for their decoration, flatten them, dye them, and then stitch them into patterns for uh, beautiful geometric designs onto their clothing. I love it that art wasn't something that Westerners just invented because they could sell it. This was just something that the natives used to make life more beautiful. Exactly. You know? It's truly amazing to find an art museum of this caliber in Orange, Texas. The Starks were all about preserving and sharing beautiful artwork with the world, both man-made art and natural art. We now interrupt this programming to remind you to like and subscribe. Now back to the road. The Starks appreciated the art of nature so much and were so inspired by the classic 30s black and white film Lost Horizon that they created their own mysterious natural utopia. And just like in the movie, things here aren't always what they seem. What? What's going on? Why am I in black and white? Where am I? At Shangri-La. Who said that? I did, Chet. Wait, who are you? I'm you, Chet. In 1937. What? We've been waiting a long time for you, Chet. Here at Shangri-La. This is strange. How did I get here? You were always here, Chet. In your heart. That doesn't make any sense. Can I just go back to color, please? No. You can never go back once you come to Shangri-La. You can never leave. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But you do have to go through the main entrance. Yes, yeah. There you go. Off you go. Off you go. I guess the front entrance would work. Back in the 1950s, as many as 12,000 guests a day would visit these gardens. And though they once fell into disrepair, 
the Stark Foundation has reinvested millions to bring them back to glory. The grounds are huge, containing garden after garden, filled with flower after flower. Some of the Stark's original greenhouses are even still on site. It is amazing that something like this exists in Orange, Texas. But it's perhaps even more amazing that a multi-million dollar foundation cares enough about nature to build something like this. For plant lovers, it doesn't get much better. And for animal lovers, well, it's pretty awesome too. So this is Ruby Lake, and during peak season, over 2,000 birds will be nesting right here in these trees. But you have to be very, very quiet. Right now, there are at least 100 egrets out there, just one of the dozens of species you might see, not to mention the other animals. But one of the best ways to enjoy both the flora and fauna of Shangri-La is by boat. And our guide for today is naturist Susan Montaigne. So what bayou are we on right now? We are on Adams Bayou, and it originates 14 miles north of here in Mauriceville as a drainage ditch. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most beautiful drainage ditch I've ever seen. But we have a lot of little waterways that feed into it, uh -huh. so we're a watershed for a lot of communities. Okay. It's, and it's a great habitat for all kinds of species of animals. Now, I know most of Shangri-La is undeveloped, is that right? Yes, we have 252 acres, and I would say probably about nine-tenths of it is not developed. Wow, cool. Cool, so it all looks pretty much like this. Yes. Right? We're coming up now on a pink tree. Pink oh, yeah. lichen that you see in front of it is very unusual. It's an air quality indicator, uh -huh. and the early French explorers would write in their journals when they came to this area about the pink forest. And you used to didn't see it in the 70s and all that, but now we're seeing more and more pink lichen. That's awesome. It means the air is getting cleaner. Yes. The brackish dark water, the moss-covered trees, and the curious animals of the bayou all create something that truly feels like a magical garden. Something fit for a king, or make that a grand champion. This tree that we're looking at right here is a gorgeous pond cypress, uh -huh. and it's a grand champion state Texas tree. Really? And the reason why it's a grand champion is because of its age. 1,238 years old. You're lying. We've had three separate experts at three different times come in and do a core sample, mm -hmm. and all three of them concurred and found that it was over 1,200 years old. Amazing. It's here long before we got here, and they'll be here long after yeah. we're gone. And for another 1,200 years. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope, right? With the right conservation efforts and enough folks who care just like Mr. Stark did, anything is possible. Now, spending time on the water is one of my favorite things to do. And aboard a slow-moving boat like this one is one way to do it. But out here in Orange, there are other options. After all, we have yet to see a Texas gator. And to do that, well, we'll need to hit the bayou like the real swamp people do. Yeah, I've been waiting all day to uh, see one of these gators out here, and I'm feeling pretty good about this here right now. But if, if we don't catch one, then we just gonna have to call this whole dang thing off. We're just gonna have to call this day trip quits and go back home, I guess, you know? We've gotta find a gator now, now, now. Swamp people like me have to make a living. We make our living on gators. We gonna go down that boat, the head boat. We gonna find that dead gator. We gonna be laying up on that log, man. We gonna take him, we gonna eat him, we gonna throw that salt on the list. I mean, it all rides on this here right now, right now. That ponytail's awesome, but it gets in my face, you know? I mean, it's it. It's our one hope right now, this moment. It's like Luke Skywalker in that movie Star Trek. It has to happen now. Oh, I guarantee it's gonna be some good down gator meat. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Well, you know, I could put these anacondas out to find me a gator, bring one back, but I'm gonna have to catch it alive. These things slaughter gators. Oh, shot. This one killed a 14 footer one time. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. This one over here killed a 15 footer one time. It's a good thing I'm in the middle of them, or they're gonna they eat each other. You know what I mean? Well, the mission is clear. Gator or bust. And no better way to do it than on a ride with Airboat Rides, Inc. and Captain C.J. Jurgensen. How are we gonna do this? Well, we're gonna get in this airboat, idle out, see as many gators as we possibly can, then we'll get out there in the, in the Sabine and see some more. Awesome. Have some fun. Very good. The coolest part about an airboat is the massive propeller. It's essentially a big fan blowing us down the bayou. And with the Corvette engine right on board, it means these babies can fly. But it also means that they are loud! 
Well, the biggest benefit to these airboats is that since there's nothing below water, these boats can maneuver into some of the shallowest and most remote parts of the swamp. Wow. This is Blue Elbow Bio, and if you kind of hear, this is what it sounds like uh, in the swamp at about 6.30 at night. I love it. <laughs> the cicadas are loud, the birds chirping. This is about the time the alligators start to come out, right? They do. They start moving out and start hunting. Uh, we'll see some night herons, maybe some little birds floating around, uh -huh. cool. and then the, that's the dinner bell. There it goes. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Alligators hunt at night. Yeah, you know, pretty much strictly. We'll see during the day tours some of the smaller ones. The bigger ones, the older they are and the more wary they are. Of course, yeah. It's beautiful out here on the it bayou. It is. I could stay out here all night. <laughs> really? Yeah, <laughs> I bet. And as we cruise around, it's just like the captain said. As the day gets darker, the gators come out to play. Here's a four-footer looking for a snack, which today is Cheetos? Okay. <laughs> There's an alligator right there. Uh -huh. Eating Cheetos. That seems so wrong. Well, they are delicious, I suppose. But here's another one. And while these little guys don't qualify as river monsters, they are still gators in the wild on the bayou, which is very cool in and of itself. I'd say our gator hunt was a success. So after this tromp through the bayou, I'm ready for some bayou style eating. And for that, there's no better place in Orange than Robert's Meat Market and Steakhouse. Complete with dining room for the restaurant eaters and Cajun Market for the do-it-yourselfers. Okay, so this is Robert Ramirez and we're here on the market side of Robert's. And a lot of this stuff looks familiar, but there are some really special things in this counter. This is uh, Cajun Boudin. We got a mile, we got crawfish, and we have spicy. Wow, y'all make y'all's own booty? We make it here on right on location. Oh, that's right. awesome. Well, we have rolls, sirloins, T-bones, porterhouse, the one shish kebab, we make them. Oh, we got frog legs. Frog legs! See, that's the kind of thing you'll find down here in Southeast Texas. You cannot find frog legs in Central Texas. How about, how about gator meat? No, yeah, definitely not gator meat. That's awesome. We, uh, we smoke our own sausage. It all looks fantastic. So all the steaks the folks are eating over there all get prepped over here. Everything that's uh, cooked right there is, is cut right here, from this side to that side. Gotcha. Everything's fresh. I've gotten really hungry, so I think now it's time for me to move over on that side and have some dinner. Well, let's go. All right. <laughs> and what started is just a few tables by the meat counter is now one of the biggest restaurants in Orange. But Robert still hasn't lost his old school methods, doing everything by hand with only the freshest ingredients. What's good here? The menu. <laughs> I like that answer. I like that it's answer. It's just the God's honest truth. I mean, everything I've had here has just been really, really good. First time here? Oh, no. I've been coming here for 25 years. Really? Oh, yeah. The food's just outstanding. Do you ever get uh, steaks over there? Oh, the pizza? Yeah. Oh, the boudin's awesome. He makes a crawfish boudin this seasonal, you know, whenever yeah. the crawfish are in season. Uh, the portions are huge. We're sharing a dinner because, you know, way too much. I got the Mexican food, came with a steak. What, Mexican food and steak together? It was kind of like a made mom fajita. I just <laughs> sliced it up, rolled it in a tortilla, and it was awesome. There you go, awesome. So now comes the dilemma. Classic steak or homemade Texas Cajun? Well, I am in Southeast Texas. Hoo-hoo, look at this. So I come all the way down here to Southeast Texas. You know I got to get some Cajun food, especially when the place makes their own boudin. Homemade boudin, and back here, crawfish etouffee. What is a boudin ball, you ask? Well, let's look inside. Dirty rice, crawfish, Cajun seasonings, and then, of course, it's breaded, deep-fried to a delicious golden brown ball. Mmm, man. It comes with ranch, but I grew up eating these things with yellow mustard. I don't know if that's Cajun, but that's the way I was raised, and I can't break away now. To my main course right here, etouffee. Mmm. <clears throat> man, that is good. I love the onions, the bell peppers. Here at Robert's, they got kind of that creamy angle on it. Oh, it's delicious. So the first course was Cajun. The second course, purely Texan right here. That is a perfect medium rare right there. When a ribeye is done right, ain't no other steak that can touch it. And this one right here is done right. What a day. Orange is much more than just the Texas Gateway. It's a full-on Texas destination, a place where swampy lowlands meet towering pines, locally famous cuisine meets world-famous art, and the orange of the past blends with the orange of today into one very, very sweet day trip. Well, you know, I don't know what else to say, but it has been a phenomenal day here in Southeast Texas. And Orange, you glad you came along for the ride.
<laughs> anyway, I'll see all y'all out on the road. Vaya con Dios, amigos. Man, it is amazing that something like this exists. Man, 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 dude. It's like organic and natural, man. Right. The place where Texas ends. And just to give you an idea, uh -huh, uh -huh. all right, you and I, I started singing or something. So this is Ruby Lake. Over a hundred, <laughs> sorry, over. I tried to swap them. All right. Because I can't find gators without the stars and stripes here on my head. They, they guided uh, George Washington, they can guide me straight to the alligators. Go go down that bow, go do down that old little silly little gay little bee. And then, when we do that, oh, we gonna eat him. Oh, shot. Howdy, y'all. Follow along with my adventures at Chet Tripper on Instagram and at the Day Tripper TV on Facebook and YouTube. Or head to thedaytripper.com for travel guides, past episodes, and info on our mobile app and Team Day Tripper. This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Howdy, y'all. Chet the Day Tripper here. Thanks so much for tripping with us. Uh, remember, while you're here, like this video, subscribe to our channel so that we can stay out there on the road and keep on tripping. <laughs> Did we miss anything in this town? Leave us a comment, let us know. We love finding out about new stops with all your tips. And if you love Epic Texas Day Trips, remember to check our channel. We got a lot of them on there. Also, don't forget, if you want some sweet Day Tripper merch or another cool Texas made product, Come see us in Georgetown at the Day Tripper World Headquarters. You can also shop online if you check the link down there in the caption. All right, y'all. Bye, con Dios, amigas.